I think God allows a certain amount of suffering in our lives because it changes us. It grows us. The Bible tells us it sanctifies us. It prepares us. And it gives us empathy and compassion for those who are suffering. And that helps us then be the hands and feet of Christ that we're called to be. Please be aware that this episode includes a discussion about acts of self-harm and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised and if you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of self-harm, please contact the National Suicide Hotline by calling or texting 988. Welcome back to the Finding Something Real podcast. This is your host, Janelle Wood, and you are listening in for Season 7, where we talk with different young women from various backgrounds about their faith journeys and allow them space space to ask tough questions about God and Christianity. Today, we're recording an episode with my friend, Lizzie. I highly recommend listening to Lizzie's first episode where she shared about her story and her questions. If you haven't listened to that, here's a short clip from our first conversation together. I was asking you Mm. about belonging and if you ever felt God calling you or, you know, his love for you. And you said you weren't sure about the love. Yeah. So I like really struggled like with where I belonged, all of elementary school and then honestly all of middle, a lot of middle school too. And then high school, like, I think I honestly really haven't had any true friends until like during and after COVID. Like I had the people that I would say hi to, but it was like the few friends I did have moved away. It was just hard for me, like, because with a lot of the Christian people, like they're like not telling me with their words, but I feel like implying that I don't belong with them. But I also don't belong with a lot of other groups and life isn't groups. I understand that, but it's just like just a sense of feeling lost all the time. All right, Lizzie, you're back today. How are you doing? Okay. Okay, you're you're laying down. <laughs> I told you you could sit up if you wanted to. Yeah. But... <laughs> Low key battling. If I were like wanting slash needing ibuprofen, but not actually wanting to take it, you know. Oh no, I'm sorry. Well, I've something I've really appreciated about you, Lizzie, is that you just show up as you are. You've showed up going for walks. You've shown up. Uh, you know, hanging out, eating your lunch or whatever, and you still participate in these conversations and uh, you're blazing a trail for uh, the next round of co-hosts, I got to say, because, uh, you know, you're just saying, hey, this is me. I'm showing up the way I am. So I appreciate you being you and showing up here today and wanting to be part of these conversations. It's kind of awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, you said that you've got a uh, final finals coming up for school. Yeah, um, I finished my marketing final and I got the grade back on that. Um, my Spanish final, I need to do one more part and I need to um, spend a bunch more hours on my art final. It'll be nice when it's all over, huh? You get a little break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days. Well, Lizzie, I'm excited because we have someone that I know and a friend of mine here today to talk with us. I think you're going to like hearing from her. Her name is Jennifer DeFrates. She is a former high school teacher turned homeschool mom and Christian blogger at heavennotharvard.com and themomapologist.com. She is a CIA graduate of the Cross Examine Instructors Academy and volunteers with Mama Bear Apologetics. She has a passion for discipleship through apologetics, and her action figure would come with a coffee and a stack of books. She's also the reluctant ringleader of a small menagerie in rural Alabama. Jennifer, welcome to the Finding Something Real podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) I'm glad you're (laughs) here as well. Now, I don't know if I pronounced that word correctly, uh, but uh, what do you mean when you say you're the reluctant ringleader? of a small menagerie? Well, I'm a city girl. I grew up outside the city of Chicago. And then I married a very outdoorsy person who raised my daughter to be very outdoorsy and they loved collecting critters. So I have dogs, cats, chickens, uh, sometimes lizards. My daughter (laughs) just released a wasp that she'd been trying to Mm -hmm. rescue. I, I have no words. I just I'm go with the flow, God. I don't know what you're trying to teach me, but okay. <laughs> no, no plans to move back to the city right now? No, not right now. Uh, mm-hmm. Alabama has a lot of benefits for um, military and teachers. Okay. So it's a nice place to retire 
because they don't tax your pension as a military person or a teacher. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you and I, we first met in the summer of 2022 at Cross-Examine Instructors Academy. Um, That's an apologetics conference. So for those who are not familiar, what is apologetics and how would you describe CIA where we met? Well, apologetics is a word that's really not very popular because it comes from a Greek term, apologia, which comes from 1 Peter 3.15, to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And the Greek word apologia means to make a defense. So it's defending what we believe. It's a philosophical, um, doctrinal, scientific logic. It's using all of the capacities that God has given us to defend what we believe in addition to using scripture. And it tells us how to do so in a way that's respectful and gentle and kind. And that verse really kind of encompasses the whole message of what apologetics is. And first um, CIA was, that was my first time going was all the top apologists in the country, as many of them that can make it every year, like come and just pour into the people that attend. It is three days of intensive learning how to take all the things you know and be able to present it effectively because we shouldn't just be consumers. We want to be producers and we want to be sharing the gospel message with everyone that we come into contact with. And apologetics is just one way to do that. But the conference is really geared toward teaching us how to do that effectively and not just um, on a one-to-one level, but also for people that are interested in doing podcasts or writing blogs or hosting events at churches. It's a way of elevating how we communicate so that we're more effective for God. Mm -hmm. So you're not in the CIA? (laughs) No, I'm not in the CIA. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that would be way more exciting, I think. <laughs> Although I would probably fly under the radar. Nobody's looking for like a 50-something mom in the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a cool conference. You and I both went again as well, which was really great. And uh, yeah, it's like, what, 60 people that go. Mm-hmm. And so it, there's a lot of one-on-one and a uh, small group format type uh, mentoring that's going on. And yeah, it was pretty great. Um, How did you end up there? Would you share a little bit about your faith journey? So I would have said I was raised a Christian. I would have considered myself a Christian my whole life, um, except for maybe a few years where I kind of dabbled in trying to be an atheist. But there's a point at which when you're, as you're growing up, you have to make your faith your own. You know, you get dragged to church. I don't know about Lizzie, but every time the doors were open, My parents had us at church for something. We were there for Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, Awana's youth group. We were there. And as I kind of got into the world, you go to high school and college and very secular environments and people start to say, you know, Christianity doesn't make sense. I think it's just a book of myths. And it's easy to get manipulated into falling away. And I found that I was constantly being told that it wasn't intellectual to believe what I believed, that intelligent people couldn't believe in the Bible. And when you also just want to sin and you want to do all the things your friends are doing and party and have all the fun that they seem to be having, it's far easier to justify falling into those disbeliefs. And that's kind of what happened to me over a long period of time. Um, I would kind of have still called myself a Christian. I would have still said I believed in God, but I certainly wasn't living like it. And I would go through these periods where I really wanted to get serious about my faith, but then something would happen and tear me away. You know, like we're talking about today, suffering. When bad things happen, it's easy to get ripped away. You know, when I was in high school, I was raped. And that was probably the first major experience that really shook my faith and made me wonder how a good God could allow that to happen to me. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s and we were going through the adoption process that every time I felt like we were not going to get 
to go through the process. We weren't going to find an agency. We weren't going to get approved <clears throat> that we wouldn't get a child. I would stop and pray. And the next day or even the next hour, we'd get a yes answer. And it was like, God was trying to get my attention and bring me back to, I've always been here, Jen. I didn't walk away from you. And through that process, it was really, like I said, every single step I thought we were going to get shut down, I would pray and God would open the door, even to the point of the day before we found out we were getting a child. Um, a friend of mine had asked whether or not we knew anything and the waiting process can be forever. It's not a list like you go down and the next person gets the baby. It's a choice. The unwed mother gets to choose what kind of family she wants for her child. And you could be waiting for a long time or a very short period. And we didn't know. So I was just kind of crying out to God because the waiting was hard. And God kind of pushed on my heart. Just be patient. Enjoy the time you have. Once you get the baby, everything's going to change. And you need to just enjoy the, the time you have to just be a couple. And I was like, God, that's really wise. I will do that. I will just embrace the amount of time. 90 minutes later, we got the phone call that there was a baby on the way. So God was just continuing to walk me through. I'm still here. I'm still in your life. And when I surrendered, God, this child is yours. If you let me raise a child, I will do so under your will. It was like, then God said, yes. Then God said, yeah. Every time I surrendered steps along the way. And that really helped me start to see God differently, not just the rules and the regulations that I thought were so old fashioned and oppressive, but as a loving father that was shaping me and guiding me. And then of course, parenting really gives you that perspective because here's this person that you are trying to love, but you're also trying to give them boundaries. And yet you love them unconditionally, but sometimes that means punishing or disciplining and that's hard. It's like all of a sudden the light bulb clicked and I went, Oh, all those rules that I thought were so miserable were protecting me from me. And that was kind of what God was like, now I can use you. And he gave me this desire to read his word with like a fire. And I read the Bible three times through in like 18 months. And it really starts to change you when you spend that much time in the scriptures. And I found it coming out of my mouth. I found it being how I handled things. The first thought I had as far as answering a question would be scripture. And that really changed who I was as a parent and as a mom. So it allowed me to see God differently, desire to love and follow him differently. But as that started happening to me, my husband started questioning if any of this was really true at all. And he kind of fell down the rabbit hole of the YouTube atheists and they can sound really convincing. So he started questioning if the new Testament was true. And I had never heard some of his objections before. And that's when I Google searched some of his questions to me, like, do we have the, the originals of the New Testament? We do not. We don't even have the copies of the copies. So what does that mean for my faith? And I was kind of shaken. But I think God interceded in my Google search because he put J. Warner Wallace right at the top of my search results. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you can't deny the research that uh, Jim has done on the accuracy of the New Testament, how assured we can be that we have the original text, how that we can be assured that it hasn't been changed, it hasn't been manipulated, that the people who wrote it were original eyewitnesses, and that a lot of these atheist objections are really kind of not genuine in terms of there's more mistakes in the New Testament than there are words. That was one of the objections my husband brought up. And technically it's true, but not in a real sense. It's what we would consider typos historically. You know, somebody spelled something differently. Somebody used he where somebody used Jesus and then 
everybody who copied him used the variant. So they're actually what we call textual variants, not actually like differences or mistakes. They're just things that we have to kind of narrow down. We look at them and we compare. We can pull out the ones that don't match the originals and we can use textual criticism to find the New Testament and what it was really there. Um, some of the scholars have said we have an accuracy of either 98.3 or 99.5% of what we consider the New Testament to be the original. And when I started finding those details out, it obviously I opened the world of apologetics to me because through J. Warner Wallace, I found Greg Kokel and Gary Habermas and Frank Turek and Mama Bear Apologetics. And I've just kind of gone full force down that path. And it really changed the way I thought about my faith. It wasn't a blind belief. Because I think a lot of times people say the word faith, and they mean a blind belief in something you can't see. Whereas apologetics has taught me that faith is actually a belief in something you have good reason to believe is true. Like when you look at a chair, you have good reason to believe it will hold you if it looks like it's been put together solidly. We can base our faith on the good evidence that we do have instead of looking for the places where we might still have questions. Um, I don't know if you're the best person for me to ask, but um, if like, what do you do with that? Like for you, like, obviously you can just say like, oh yeah, you believe it and you put your faith like, but like, what's the, what's your physical actions? So... One of the things that I've done is really try to stay in my Bible. If I believe it's the word of God, then I have to act like that's the word of God. So I'm, I've read the Bible now 12 times through cover to cover this year. I'm reading it with three different groups of people. So I will read it three more times, assuming I don't get waylaid. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I do is I read it. It has changed the way I pray because I actually pray to a, personal God that's invested in my life. Um, it really hit home for me last June. I was in a very serious car accident. And in that moment where you realize you're going to hit the semi, there's nothing you can do to stop it. I had a moment of total peace where I thought, oh, I really believe this. I believe I'm going to close my eyes here and wake up with Jesus and it will be okay. And I said a prayer of protection over my daughter that my sisters would know how to take care of her and close my eyes. And then I was fine. But in that moment, I realized I really believe this. It's not just an intellectual exercise. I have a firm foundation that God is real and that all these things we talk about in the Bible, as far as salvation and how to work out what that looks like in your life is real. And I think that was really, as much as no one wants to get into a car accident, I think God really used that moment to give me a confidence in what I believe that was outwardly, maybe not super life changing, but inwardly. It's different when you know that this is true and you can have a firm foundation like that. It was really kind of amazing. Did that answer your question, Lizzie? Yeah, somewhat. Okay. So other things are looking at what the New Testament says about how we're supposed to live. What kind of things we're supposed to put in our minds, like Philippians 4, 8, whatever is lovely, whatever is true, whatever's excellent, think about these things. So that works out in what kind of music I listen to, what kind of TV shows I watch, what kind of books I read, um, what kind of things I allow my daughter to watch and read. We spend a lot of time talking things through. Like we might watch something that's not perfectly Christian content and talk about what are the messages in here? How does that really relate back to scripture? You know, Mama Bear talks about how to roar through things. You recognize the message, you offer discernment, argue for a healthier approach and then reinforce those ideas. We do that all the time in like real life. Hey, that TV commercial, what was that commercial trying to teach us? What was it saying about who we are? And we just walk through some of those things and compare them to the new Testament because 
if, well, the whole Bible fits together. And I think sometimes people like to pull parts of it apart. But if you look at the whole Bible, there's six, over 66,000 um, correlations where the, te- the Bible is quoting itself or prophesying and quoting. It's, there's a picture of it that's just impossible the number of correlations in the both testaments. So the whole Bible is instructive, but I think sometimes on our daily life, the new Testament can give us some real clear, like do this, don't do this kind of things. And that's, that's helpful because if it's God's word, then we have to hold ourselves to that, that standard the best we can. Jen, you've, you've been through some hard things. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the car accident, because I just knowing you a little bit would say that was one of quite a few times that you've had to know whether your faith could hold you. (laughs) Um, But I'm wondering if you mentioned that I think it was your late 30s, when you were really going through that time with your adoption process and going, okay, Lord, you know, I surrender and then seeing him come through and I surrender seeing him come through. Before that, though, I guess, you know, between the time you were Lizzie's age, maybe 19 to that time 20 years later, what was your faith like? And would you share a little bit about your marriage? So my faith at that point was very cultural. Like, I think that was an easier default position maybe 30 years ago when the culture was very still Christian in a lot of ways. It was easier to kind of just fall through the cracks of, if you go to church, you're a Christian. Or if you're not another religion, you're a Christian. Like it wasn't, I had not personally defined it as an adult. I was, I became a Christian when I was six. I was baptized when I was 11. And then I kind of just believed that there was probably a God. I think I went through a period of trying to convince myself God wasn't real. And God just never let me go. And I kept kind of trying to come back Um, I'd get serious about my faith for a little while and then something would happen. So I've actually been married um, two more times and was abused and cheated on and abandoned. And Satan likes to use the pain in our lives to tear us away. And I let him. And I think that's what changed with my late husband when he became an atheist and I don't know what he really believed because we only know somebody from the outside, even somebody we're that close to, but he suffered from PTSD. He'd been in the military for 20 years. He was in the Marines and the army. He did multiple deployments uh, in combat, saw horrific things, things no one should ever have to see. And it changed him and it made him question God's goodness and question his faith. I don't know what in the end, what he believed, but learning apologetics helped me at least answer his objections when I could, when he would listen. Um, But PTSD and, and traumatic brain injury. So he'd been blown up near major explosions. He set up about 20 times when he was in Iraq that that does irreparable damage to your brain. So I don't know what his thought processes really were. Um, In the end, it's hard because a lot of it appears kind of like dementia, you know, memory loss, paranoia. I mean, it's brain damage. So I don't know what he was really thinking, but I know that God, there were times God gave me answers and just put on my heart, like the right thing to say at the right moment that at least he acknowledged there was a God and, um, I just don't know whether or not he ever truly surrendered to God. I have hope that he did because I know that God loved him more than I loved him. But it was a long process of watching him really struggle um, until he finally took his life. And that was the night that probably my faith took the biggest test because I had been praying for him for decades. You know, military life, I have friends literally all over the world that were praying for him and to feel like this was the answer. Why did God allow this to happen? And I lay in bed that night trying to sleep. I mean, I don't even know how you sleep after that kind of trauma. And 
I said, God, the universe still didn't create itself. The universe didn't design itself. We can't explain origin of life. And Jesus walked out of that grave. If those four things are true, then you are real. And even though I don't feel like I can trust you right now, I know that you are real and I can trust you. Kind of like the father in the New Testament that said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. And I just prayed that. I probably prayed that every night for I don't even know how many months. Lord, I believe, just help my unbelief. And I just kept trusting that God was there and he was present. And I could see how people stepped up and were the hands and feet of Christ for us. And that really helped me see that God's presence wasn't just in my head. Uh, I had a moment where I was praying and I go for walks and I usually listen to podcasts. And this day I didn't. I felt like I was going to just take a prayer walk, which is not usually how I do things. It's just not my style. But I thought, okay, God, we'll have a chat today. And we, I walked and I talked with him and I had a prayer request that I had not thought of before that moment, but it was my daughter's birthday coming up in about a month and a half. And with my husband's death, we just didn't know what income was going to look like. And I did not want her birthday to be marred with like the end of her childhood. You know, I wanted her to have a childhood still that was still celebrated and she was still important. And I just didn't know where the money was going to come from to give her a party. And I was like, God, I know this is silly. Like we can find other ways to celebrate. It doesn't have to cost money. Like, but if you could work it out. So I have enough to throw her a little party. That would be great. Just a little prayer request. And I didn't think anything of it. And a few hours later, my Venmo app sends me that little text message. Your friend has sent you $500. I, I looked at that and said, happy birthday, Allison. And I texted her and I said, there was way too many zeros in that gift for my daughter. And she said, oh no, God told me to pay for her birthday party. This is not somebody I had spoken to. This wasn't somebody I had told. Like, I didn't tell anybody about the prayer request. I didn't even tell my daughter about the prayer request. Nobody knew except God. There is no way she knew to answer that that day unless God's told her to. So that was just a little thing that in the grand scheme of eternity didn't mean much, except that it was an answer to prayer when I needed to know God was listening. And that really is a moment I treasure because the God of the universe who's holding together everything by the, by his will cared enough to make sure my daughter had a birthday party. And God doesn't always answer all of our prayer requests like that. I know that, but that day he did. And it's, it's special. Yeah. Did you feel during that season that the fact that you had dived into reasons for faith, that you had been reading in your scriptures, that you had been spending time in spiritual discipline with the Lord, that that prepared you in a way for that unexpected uh, thing happening in your life? Was it something that you were like, wow, I can see how God has prepared me in a way for what I'm experiencing now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, before all that, I had had a hip surgery that did not go well that required another hip surgery that did not go well, that required another hip surgery that did not go well. So I spent 10 years having hip surgeries and recovery, hip surgery, recovery, hip surgery, recovery, over and over and over again. So I was in and out of braces, wheelchairs, crutches, walkers. And I just thought, what on earth are you doing, God? And it was one of the few times I feel like God you know, I hate to say this, like spoke to me because I don't think God generally speaks to us, but it was one of those times where it was like, God was like, I am doing something, be patient. And I could not for the life of me see what he was doing with all of this pain and misery, but it really helped humble me because I couldn't fix it. There was no amount of my own personal strength, no amount of doing my physical exercises that could fix the things that needed fixing inside. And it was because I couldn't get up 
and run the marathons that I like to run or do the other things and be the Pinterest perfect, cute mom doing all the fun. I had to sit on the couch. That was all I could do. And God was like, but now I can use you. And he got my attention that way first. And that was part of the process of me having time to read the Bible all that, all those times of looking for ways to serve my church, running Bible studies out of my home because I couldn't really go anywhere. You know, there was a lot of things that I can see now that seemed inconvenient, that seemed like pointless struggles that really prepped me to be the person I needed to be when I faced the crisis that nothing can prepare you for except God. And um, you more recently have been through some hard things as well. Um, Did you mind sharing a little bit about that as well? Um, In December, my dad walked out of the facility where he was living and somebody gave him a ride thinking they were being helpful and he couldn't remember where he wanted to go. And he ended up uh, being left off in the orange groves in California and wandered off into the middle of the orange groves and got lost and passed away. He was missing for two weeks uh, before they found his body. That was really a traumatic way to lose your dad. Like we knew he was struggling with, um, we think probably CTE. I don't remember what it stands for, but boxers and football players get it because of all the head injuries. And my dad had played football for way too many years and plus had been in the military. Um, But it presents like dementia. So we knew we were losing him. We just didn't expect it to be like that. Um, He, He'd been given a prognosis of six months and 10 years later, he was still pretty functional. Um, But I think he was just getting to a point where he couldn't do the day-to-day things and couldn't remember. And when he got lost, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to handle it. And he had deliberately taken his cell phone out of his pocket and his safety device. So we couldn't track him. And it was just, uh, it was just painful to trust, you know, where's my dad? How do we do this? Do we fly to California? Because none of us live out there. He he was near his sister. And we just spent a lot of time praying and then got the devastating news that all the sightings we'd had were a homeless man that looked a lot like my dad. So it was just, it was just a heartbreaking situation. We're actually having his memorial next week and it's just, it's just grief, you know, but my dad knew the Lord, you know, we know that when he closed his eyes in that orange grove, he opened them in heaven. We have no doubt that that is true. My dad spent his whole life teaching people about Jesus. In fact, when he was uh, in first or second grade, like very young, his art teacher finally said, is there something you can draw other than crosses? (laughs) And he said, but that's what I want to draw. He, he just was always drawn to Jesus and spent his whole life trying to lead people to Christ or demonstrate Christ to them. So we know that that's where he is, but it's still painful. Yeah. Well, we I miss. Oh, yeah, Lizzie. Go ahead, Lizzie. Oh, like, what do you think the point of that is? Like, is it just about free will or is it like, is there like something more? So I think you kind of hit on it that there's, there, we do have free will, and that's a lot of why we see suffering in the world, because we make choices. And I don't know about you, Lizzie, but I made a lot of dumb ones when I was young. And a lot of my suffering was caused by myself, choosing the wrong friends or the wrong people to hang out with or making poor decisions, like waiting to the last minute before a final exam to open the book. <laughs> I'm sure you've never done that, Lizzie, but <laughs> I was like the procrastination queen. I think I wrote a 12 page paper. I started the research the night before it was due. That was on me, you know? So some of it's our free will. Um, But the Bible teaches us that God doesn't waste those things. So even though the consequences might be because we did something, he can still use them when we surrender them to him. 
The story of Joseph is always really encouraging to me. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Joseph from the Old Testament, but his brothers hate him because he's the favorite and his dad shows it. So they decide they're going to beat him up and throw him in a pit and they debate killing him for a while. And they're like, eh, we can make some money off this. Let's just sell him into slavery instead. That'll be great. So they sell him into slavery and he then kind of rises through the ranks as a slave because he's faithful to God and God blesses everything he touches till he is like second in command. And then his owner's wife accuses him of raping her because she came on to him and he didn't respond because he was righteous and he was obedient to God. So then he gets thrown in jail where again, his faithfulness and obedience to God, he starts to get some like responsibilities and trust. And a couple of the pharaohs, uh, the cupbearer and his baker get thrown in to prison and they have these crazy dreams. Like, what do these dreams mean? Joseph's like, well, my God can tell me what those dreams mean. And he tells them what the dreams mean. And he eventually gets elevated out of prison to be second in command when he can tell the Pharaoh what his dreams meant. And he runs the entire country. There's nothing except the crown that is off limits to Joseph. And because of that, when there's a famine, he's able to save the entire nation of Israel. That story reminded me there was 20 years it wasn't like a few months of, man, this is miserable. It was 20 years of suffering, questioning, wondering, feeling completely cut off from everybody he loved back home, wondering if his family was even alive. And yet God used all of that to prepare him for the main mission of saving the people of Israel. So I think some of it is we do it to ourselves as human beings. We live in a fallen, broken world. And some of it is that God then uses his ability of providence to help things work out for our good. If you look at Romans 8, 28, it says that all things work together for the good of those who believe, who are called according to his purpose. So it doesn't make everything okay. It doesn't always make everything even feel good. It just makes us know that everything is part of the plan that God's going to use and sometimes it's just in small ways, you know, like being raped in high school. What in the world was that about? But because of that moment, when I saw that expression and that pain in a student of mine in high school, she was late coming to take a makeup test and she was crying and just kind of acting agitated. And I said, what's going on with you? And she said, I, I don't think I can tell you. I, I can't talk about it. And I looked her right in the eye and said, were you raped? Her whole face changed and she said, how did you know? And I was like, because I've been there. And I ended up getting her to call the police and we were able to get the um, police report taken and stop someone that had been sexually abusing her sister and her for years. So does that make what I went through worth going through? Absolutely. One person's life was changed because I suffered something which gave me a sense of compassion and empathy that I might've missed otherwise. And I've really noticed that going through all of the different types of suffering that I've gone through in the last 15 years or so has given me an empathy for people that I don't think I would have had. I had a pretty easy childhood. I had a pretty easy life. And when you do that, sometimes you miss the suffering that other people are experiencing. And when you miss their suffering, it's hard to reach in and be real with people. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this podcast is finding something real. And in order to do that with someone, you kind of have to be real and suffering does help us do that. So I think God allows a certain amount of suffering in our lives because it changes us. It grows us. The Bible tells us it sanctifies us. It prepares us and it gives us empathy and compassion for those who are suffering. And that helps us then be the hands and feet of Christ that we're called to be. 
I have a follow-up question to that, um, which you kind of just touched on a lot of it, but I just pushing on that a little bit as a, an advocate for somebody listening who maybe is not a believer, Jen. Um, I mean, you've just described uh, a lot of circumstances that um, are really hard, uh, experiencing rape, uh, the destruction of multiple marriages, abuse, um, rejection, physical pain, um, you know, the death of a loved one in a traumatic way, maybe infertility, uh, mm -hmm. chronic pain, um, the mystery of wondering where your loved one is and then finding out that they're gone. All these things, God could have intervened in an instant and it wouldn't have happened. How mm -hmm. can you tell somebody who's listening who questions whether there's a God who loves them? Yeah, God loved me even in the middle of all of that. How would you respond to that? That's a really tough question. Um, some of it is just a sense of personal peace that I just know he's present with me. And some of it goes back to if something is true, it's true whether I feel it or not. Because there are some days I don't feel it. There are days I wake up and go, God, I don't feel your presence. I know you're there, but I don't feel it today. But I go back to what I know is true. And our feelings don't change. Like whether I feel like gravity is real or not, I, I'm not going to float off into, the, into space because I stopped feeling like gravity was true. So one of the things is kind of taking charge of your emotions and recognizing that our feelings indicate what's going on inside of us. They shouldn't get to dictate how we live. They don't get to dictate what is true. So separating out how we feel versus what's true, I think is really important. Um, and also recognizing that in that suffering, in that pain, if God didn't change it, then he's got a reason. I've seen enough in my life where I can trace this happened, but it led to this. This happened, but it led to this. Like you said, my infertility journey. So knowing I could never have children biologically after I had to have a hysterectomy. If I hadn't had a hysterectomy, if I'd had my own biological children, would I probably have gone through the difficult adoption process? Probably not. So God planned for my daughter to be my daughter for a reason. And if I had not had infertility issues, who knows where she would be? You know, because she's adopted, she would still exist, but she might not know the Lord. And I've seen her faith is just that night when we were laying in bed and I was bawling my eyes out. And she said, you know, mom, mom, what are you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And I said, I just don't want this to cause you to lose your faith. And she goes, absolutely not. If anything, it will strengthen it. And I don't know where a 10 year old got the wisdom to say that to me in that moment, but she held me and prayed that first night. And I know God has been good like that. Even in the suffering has walked alongside me. He's shown me how he, his, his hand works. You know, my suffering actually started when I was born. I was born with a really severe birth defect. And in 1971, most doctors looked at that birth defect. It was called gastroschisis and said, we're just going to let her die. That's the most compassionate thing to do. And my dad had been a mentor at Wheaton College. And he'd been mentoring a young man whose father happened to be my mom's obstetrician. And he said, I can't write to my son and tell him I didn't try to save his daughter. So God orchestrated that relationship to save my life before I was even growing in my mom's womb. Like I've seen God deliberately orchestrate events in my life that appear on the surface to be suffering, but in the end turn out to be for his glory. So I try to look at the suffering as a way of glorifying God in hard things. And I like to read stories like Corey Ten Boom. Uh, there's a book called Evidence Not Seen by Darlene Dibler Rose. And she was taken captive during World War II in the Philippines by the Japanese and in a concentration camp. 
and the horrific conditions and trials and things that she went through, she just glowed with God's love. And seeing how that affected everybody around her, God didn't take her out of that. He used her through it. So I try to remember that sometimes God puts us in those tough places because the the way that we're going to glorify him is going to save other people. Like not us personally, but through sharing the gospel that we're going to have the ability to be part of that story. And just like Corey Ten Boom, how many Jews came to Christ because of her and her sister holding Bible study in the middle of a concentration camp during the Holocaust? We'll never know. There are probably thousands of people that are Christians today because they survived the concentration camp and heard the gospel because of Corey and her sister, Betsy. I just, I just want to be faithful in the hard things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Lizzie, I have more questions here, but do you have anything you want to add or any questions you want to ask? Um, I don't, I don't know. No, no, we're not right now. Okay. So Jen, something that I think of sometimes and something I struggle with in my own journey is, uh, you know, in, in scripture, when Peter is being reinstated by Jesus uh, after the resurrection, they go for a walk. And uh, if, if I'm getting my stories correct, this is what's going on. And Jesus is telling him, hey, I want you to feed my sheep. And he tells him again, tells him again, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then he says, I tell you the truth, one day you're going to stretch out your hands. You're going to go someplace you don't want to go and you're going to be led somewhere you don't want to be led. Um, you know, and he basically tells them, like, it's not going to be good for you, Peter, but you're going to do it because you love me kind of thing. And Peter turns around and he goes, well, what about him? He's pointing <laughs> to John. Right. And Jesus mm -hmm. says, uh, if I want him to stay around till I come back, what is that to you? Right. You feed my mm -hmm. sheep. And I love that story in scripture because I struggle with that. Like, okay, I'm doing the thing. All right, Lord, I'll be obedient. But what about them? You know, like, how come they get it easier? How come they got this kind of thing? And so I'm wondering if you ever struggle with that, Jen, do you ever struggle with the comparison trap of like, man, how come I got the short end of the stick? Why did I get to deal with all this stuff? Uh, couldn't I have it a little bit differently? Uh, why Why did you give it to me this way, Lord? Is that something you struggle with? And if you do, how do you combat that? I think that's human nature. We all compare. Uh, I was on a launch team for a book called Compared to Who by Heather Creekmore a few years ago. And... That was probably well, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it really opened my eyes to the source of that comparison is vanity. We want to be thought of well. We want to be, have an easy life. We want, you know, it's selfishness at the core and it's not trusting God. And that kind of gave me a new perspective of going, oh, I can be happy for what somebody else's success is and not feel bitter about it because that's not what God has for me today. I, he didn't give me the talent to be an amazing Grammy award winning music artist because he has something else for me to do. And it was able to kind of shift my perspective and help me see that God has given me unique skills, talents, ideas, flaws, struggles to point me where he wants me to go. There are people that I come across with in my daily life because of what I've gone through. Okay, I wasn't going to share this story, but it's kind of funny. So one of the times that my hip dislocated, I was in the emergency room and they're about to pop my hip back in and they give you drugs so that you don't remember what's happening, but you're not really asleep. And apparently I screamed, Jesus loves you and wants to forgive your sins. <laughs> While they were popping my hip back in, they said that was the nicest thing anyone had ever said. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, it, it's a small thing. And I don't know that it affected anybody in that room. But that was kind of my goal. Can I be the person in the emergency room that's still smiling with the joy of Jesus? Who still can joke? even though I'm crying in pain, can I be the one who points to God through it all? Because the, God put me there. 
I had a former student of mine who was in a severe accident and burned really badly. And he was getting, he had just beat brain cancer. And now he's in this horrible accident and burned over a good portion of his body. And he's being wheeled into the emergency room. You know, the doctors are going to do debris to it. If you've ever been burned, you know how painful this is going to be. And he's holding his dad's hand and he prayed. Now, I know what I would have prayed for in that situation. He prayed that God would use him as a witness in this moment. And I just thought, what strength of character, what faith. And even though he's younger than me, it was a very good example to me of what it should look like to go through hard things and do it well. And I've always kind of held on to that example of somebody who just wants to glorify God, even in the worst places, even in the concentration camp, even in the pit that we've been thrown into sometimes, sometimes of our own choices and sometimes of the choices of other people. Can we glorify God no matter where we are? You know, if I'm going to get thrown in prison, then I'm going to have a prison ministry. What can I do to glorify God no matter where I am? And when I started focusing on things like that, it kind of took the sting out of the hard things. Because then it's not about it being hard. It's about finding the ways to find joy in it and show other people how they can work through hard things with their faith intact instead of letting it get them discouraged and broken. I think the American church has overwhelmingly done a discredit to a lot of believers by tying prosperity to salvation. And not every church does this, but there's kind of this overwhelming sense of if God really loves you, you will have this perfectly easy life. And that's not what the Bible actually teaches. It says, do not be surprised when you face trials of various kinds. This isn't supposed to be a surprise to us. We're supposed to be struggling. You know, the apostles said we were crushed from every side. We thought we were going to die. Why do we expect that we're going to get this easy life? I think sometimes we get an easy life when God, we're not walking in God's will for us, when Satan doesn't have any reason to mess with us. And I just don't want to live a quiet life like that. I want to live a life that's out loud for God, even if it costs me. The story of David, when he wanted to build an altar for the Lord, and he was on the threshing floor. And the guy who owned the threshing floor said, oh, I'll give it to you. And David said, absolutely not. What sacrifice would it be if I gave something that didn't cost me anything? I want my life to cost something so that my sacrifice to God is worth it. Hmm. Is there ever a point where you're like, okay, God, I think we're good. I think we're good. Don't touch this now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Like, be careful what you pray little, for. <laughs> there's a little bit of that, like doing this podcast. I'm like challenging, you know, it's, it is hard, but I have to say that no matter what happens, even the worst thing I can imagine, could I still walk in faith? Doesn't change the fact that God created the universe. We have no explanation for it. Doesn't change how we got life. Like, the universe doesn't work without God. And if those things are true, then God is real, whether it feels like it or not. And I go back to the same thing. I think that apologetics has really helped me have that firm understanding of the truth of this world is best described by the God of the Bible and by his word. And as long as I can hold on to that, I, I don't know how that my faith could be shaken. It might you be. Oh, go ahead, Lizzie. Oh, could you send Janelle some of that stuff like that really helps you some of the truth? I think that could be helpful for me. Okay, can you say that again, please, just a little bit? Oh, um, if you had the like the resources um of what helped you like cement your your truths, um, could you send that to Janelle so then she could send it to me? I think that would help me. Sure. Um, I could tell you right now some of it. Uh, the book "I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist" is a really great place to start because he apologetics, because I've been on the launch team for their last two books. And I'm a contributor to the third book that comes out in just a couple weeks. 
Well, that's exciting. Yeah, it's honest prayers for mama bears. So it's all about uh, how to pray. You know, when you have a teenager who's prodigal, when you have a spouse that doesn't believe, when you lose your spouse, when you have a three-year-old who won't go to bed in their own bed, like it's prayers from beginning to end, anything that you can think of that might be relevant for a mom to pray and just samples of prayers and questions you can kind of walk through to help you kind of guide you in prayer. Mm, love that. It's going to be a nice resource. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of final questions here, Jen. Um, for somebody who knows somebody who's going through a season of suffering, um, how would you encourage that person to comfort or be there for that person in their time of just wrestling through um, the experience of, of real suffering? I think the best thing that people did for us was just show up. There's a lost art of presence. The people that made a huge difference the day after my husband took his life, literally, I had a friend come and hold my daughter for, I think, eight hours, just sat there and held her. And another friend came and just sat with me because we were literally in shock and we can't process and having someone just be there. You know, the, the story of Job is a good example. The first week where they all just sat. And then don't do what they did the second week, which is start telling him how his sin led to all this. Sometimes stuff happens that isn't a result of our sin. And we need to be careful we're not using platitudes. Like nobody needs to hear the minute their five-year-old son is killed in a car accident. Everything happens for a reason. Like don't, don't do that, right? Like we need to be careful we're not issuing platitudes. Hey, God's still here. I don't know how to help you right now. Is there something tangible I can do? Can I pick up your groceries? Can I mow your lawn? Can I watch your kids? Can I clean your toilets? Do something tangible for people that are suffering. Be present for them. Let them deal with their feelings. Like your theology doesn't tend to be real solid when you're going through a massive trauma. It's okay to let somebody say some things that maybe aren't 100% accurate because when you're in the painful moments, it's not a time for logic and reason. You, you just hold them. You just comfort them. Once the pain has kind of subsided a little, maybe you can have some deeper conversations. But that might be just a time to just encourage them. I know God's really still real. When you're ready, we'll talk about it. Or if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer. But let people come to you when they're ready. Let, let them suffer. Let them have their grief. We don't want to rush through it. Our modern culture says like, it's been two weeks. You should be okay by now. And I think the idea of mourning for a year, wearing black, dis displaying to everyone that you're still in mourning had a purpose. We don't do that anymore. And we tend to expect people, well, you've shaken off the initial grief. You've wiped your eyes you're back to normal, right? And it's grief is hard. Uh, losing a spouse is probably one of the most difficult experiences anyone can ever go through because it shakes your whole world. Everything you do on a daily basis revolves around your spouse. It literally is like losing the other half of who you are. And it takes a while for your brain to actually literally start working again. They call it widow's fog, but it was months of, I had stare at some of the documents I had to fill out and just be like, beyond my name. I was just kind of stuck. So be patient with people, be present with people, do tangible things for them, offer to talk, let them talk and just listen. You know, we don't always have to have all the answers. Sometimes people need to just externally process and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I would point them to some of the resources I mentioned to Lizzie. Yeah. Uh, Lizzie, I, I'd love for you to speak to this if you feel comfortable, but one of the things that you've mentioned to me in our conversations here, and especially our first conversation, but even since then with some guests, is one of your biggest questions about God is, how do you know he really loves you? Like when you look at scripture and it says that he 
he left the 99 for the one. Um, it feels like going back to that feeling thing, perhaps, uh, Lizzie, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't always feel it. Like, really? He loves me? Really? Why would he love me? Um, Lizzie, do you want to speak to that before we ask Jen uh, to give her her perspective on that question? Um, I don't know. I think you covered it pretty well. Yeah. How do you respond to that, Jen? There's a verse I'm trying to look for in Isaiah where it talks about the how God knew us and how he chose us and how he called us by name. There are times that I just kind of cling to a verse like that. And I just repeat it to myself. Now he was talking to Israel, but we can look at the scriptures throughout the, the Bible. And we see that God knows us in the womb. He, he knew us before the foundation of the world in, in Ephesians. He made good things for us to do before he formed anything else. You know, Ephesians has some good verses about that, that if God is calling you, if God is putting people in your path that are sharing the gospel, that that's him loving you. If God's putting people like Janelle in your life that are, wanting to share the love of God with you. That's a good way of knowing that God loves you, even when you don't feel it, you know, because sometimes God's love is really clear and obvious. And sometimes it's quieter. Sometimes our choices make it quieter. You know, if you're living, like I lived for a long time in complete rebellion and open sin and God's voice was very quiet. I find that God's voice gets louder the more I walk in his will for my life and not literal voice, but that I know what he wants for me on a daily basis. I get a sense of peace and his presence, not all the time, but sometimes when I'm struggling, I know that he's near me. Um, there are times that I get those answers to prayer. You know, I had a leak in my roof and I thought, I, how am I going to manage getting my roof repaired? And a guy from church sent over his handyman and took care of it for me. And it was a tiny little fix and it was all this worry. Am I going to be able to manage this? And God said, I got you. So it doesn't always work out like that, but it's nice to know that sometimes God answers our prayers in ways that show he's present, that he's involved in the people's lives around you. Just sometimes allowing other people to be the hands and feet of God when you can't feel God's love because he's spirit, letting other people love you and be involved in your life is a way to, to feel God's presence and God's love that I have found works for me. What do you think, Lizzie? Oh, no, I, I, I liked that. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. At, right after my husband's suicide, um, I had taught a marriage class. Um, being married to a non-believer is a very good test of how good of a wife can you be? How, how well do you lay down yourself for somebody else? So I was teaching a marriage class with those principles and um, her husband is, um, they run a ministry that's attached to the military from Cadence International and they have a hospitality house and they just gather. Every Friday night, it's a little family gathering. They do Bible study and dinner. And I didn't know these people other than his wife from teaching the class at our local um, the military bases Bible study. And he said, she's got some needs, guys. I'll have, a, I'll have a bunch of guys at your house Saturday morning. And sure enough, five or six guys just showed up at my house and started sweeping and raking and cutting. And they loved me. They didn't know me. All they knew was that I was a Christian. I was a widow and I needed help. And they have become my family. We meet every Friday night. We have dinner together. We walk through hard things together. We worship the Lord together. We struggle over what Hebrews means. That's a tough book. <laughs> <laughs> and we learn together. That sense of community, there's a reason why God calls us to not forsake meeting together because that community is, is one way that God shows us his love and lets us love other people. 
sometimes when I'm really struggling with feeling God's love, I go out of my way to love somebody else because that's how God reminds me that I have a purpose and that I can make somebody else's life better. And when I do that, I stop worrying about myself so much. That's good. All right, Lizzie, I've got the final question here, unless you have anything else you wanted to ask Jen or say to Jen before we close out. Um, no, nothing I can think of. Okay. It's been good hearing from her, hasn't it? Yeah. All right, Jen, the final question, it's the same one we give everybody. Finding something real is about a journey towards restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love. Real is an acronym for those things. Restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love. All things that we can that can be found in relationship with Jesus Christ. Which of those things, restoration, eternity, authenticity, and love, stands out to you the most in your life right now and why? Ooh, it's a toss-up between authenticity and restoration. Because I think... God has really challenged me. I like to always present a very polished image. I always like to be put together. I'm not the one who tends to go to the grocery store in my jammies with my hair <laughs> in a messy bun. Like that's just not who I am. But in trying too hard to look like I've got myself together, sometimes I don't get to demonstrate to people who I really am and the things I've really walked through. And then they miss out on hearing my story because it's hard to talk to the person who looks like they're got it all together and drop. Hey, I am just as much of a mess as the rest of you, but God is working through me and he's restoring me in this process. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things probably go together. You can't be rest restored if you don't admit and authentically that you need that restoration of God's love. And that's kind of where I'm at right now is learning what it looks like to be authentic, be real, be honest when I can't do things. You know, there's only so many hours in the day and yet seeing God work. One of my favorite quotes, and I heard it from William Lane Craig, but I'm not sure where it came from originally, that there's enough hours in the day to do the will of God is really rest. Like gives me a sense of rest. Like, I just have to do what God has laid out for me today. That might not be what I had on my agenda, but God has a way of interrupting my day and making sure I do exactly what he needs me to do. And when I focus on parenting like that, on being a friend like that, that's the friend that picks up the phone when somebody calls in an emergency and says, I will be right there. Don't worry about it. And being able to be used like that has been really restoring because then you see that my suffering wasn't without purpose. You know, when we see suffering that just seems meaningless, it is painful. And I have prayed sometimes, God, will you give me a glimpse of what this is doing? And he's always answered. It's not always that minute. It's not always even that week or month. But six months or so down the road, I'll go, there it is. That's why I went through that. Because now I see that. Now I see that person that needs something or now I understand this doctrine, or now I see this. God has just re really restored my faith through challenging it in a way that I never would have understood if I hadn't walked this before. Mm. So good. Jennifer DeFrady, thank you for being on the podcast. If people want to find out more about your ministry, and especially that book that you're a contributor on, uh, Mama Bear Apologetics, uh, dot org is that the best place or i think it's mama bear apologetics.com okay but i'm not there you sure go. You, you might be right i just have it saved on my computer it's always an open window there you go mama bear apologetics.com or just type it into google you'll find it uh i can vouch for the books that have come out of mama bear apologetics they're excellent and um what a wonderful honor to be included as a contributor for that and uh Thank you so much for being here. Lizzie, thank you for coming on, even though you weren't feeling good. Thanks for asking great questions and allowing the space for this conversation to flourish. And I'm just really grateful for both of you. Until next time. <laughs>